Good evening, church family. Hope you're having a good uh, week, and it's always good to be able to come to you during our midweek Bible study on Wednesday night. So thank you for tuning in. Hope you're having a wonderful week, wonderful day. Uh, reminder just to, um, you know, keep looking on the Bible app, updated prayer list. Hope you'll spend some time praying for each other, praying for those needs there. Hey, we look forward to the 24th, May 24th, when we can regather back into this building and worship the Lord together. And so it's going to be a great day, great day of celebration. Hope you'll make plans now to attend. Uh, between now and the 24th, we'll be releasing some videos with some guidelines and and some things that we're going to be putting into place, social distancing things. And so uh, just be watching for those and and uh, hope that you will uh, heed those uh, those. Uh, guidelines and and uh, so we look forward to a wonderful day on the May 24th but anyway uh, into the end let's uh, tonight let's study the Word of God we're in the book of Philippians Philippians chapter 3 as we're making our way through this book verse by verse and uh, tonight we come to a new chapter verses 1 through 7 and so hope you'll Take your Bible out and let's uh, study together as we look at these verse by verse. Let me uh, lead us in a quick word of prayer, and then I'll read this passage of Scripture, and then we'll go back and and talk about it just a little bit. Let's pray together. God, we just thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the privilege to study your Word, and I pray, God, that you'd help us as we learn together, as we find the application for our own walk with you. And so, Father, bless this time, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter 3, uh, beginning there in verse 1 and continuing through verse 7. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a prophet, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Now, interesting passage of scripture that Paul writes here in chapter 3. And he basically, what he is saying, uh, just to sum it all up, is saying that I'm doing everything for the glory and honor of Christ. All is for Him. And tonight, as we think about this, I was just thinking maybe of some type of way that would help us understand what He's saying, would help us to be able to put it in terms that, that maybe we could understand and make some application to our walk with Jesus tonight. And I want us to think about in the terms of an accountant, I don't know if you use an accountant or not, but if you do, um, you understand what an accountant does. They, It's like they audit. They have a way of going through your books, your ledger in a sense, and seeing your profits and your losses, what you have uh, gained over the past year or past few months or whatever the case may be in, in terms of business. And so I was thinking maybe we need to take an audit of our life and understand what Jesus has done for us and how he has changed us and see the profits and the losses and see the the liabilities and 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 things like that uh assets and and see what where we stand uh in our walk with Christ in our being a faithful accountant for Jesus you know like most religious people today Paul comes along here and he says man I had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but yet not enough righteousness to keep him or get him into heaven. And he realized that. It was not the bad things that kept Paul away from Jesus. It was good things, mostly. And that's our problem. You know, 
sometimes we go through life and we're doing good things, but we're not doing the best of things. It's not wrong what we're doing. It's just we're not doing it the way that the Bible instructs us to do it. And so Paul comes along and he says here, I mean, I had to lose religion and find salvation. Some people say of us, you know, well, I heard you found religion. No, you didn't find religion. It's like you lost the religion and you found Jesus Christ. And he found me and we have that relationship together now. Now, this passage of scripture speaks so very clearly of a religious man that just finally said, okay, I'm going to a faithful accountant and I'm opening up my books, my accounting books, to evaluate the spiritual wealth of my life. And as I'm doing that, I only come to find and discover that apart from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, through repentance and faith in Christ, finished work on the cross, and everything that he lived for, and all that he's possessed, was nothing. It was in vain. It wasn't going to get him anything. It wasn't getting him into heaven or anything like that. It's only through that personal relationship with Christ. Each of us... The, we know that we're going to, in our final accounting before Jesus Christ, we know that over in 2 Corinthians 5.10, where it says, For we must, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or whether bad. We ought to be faithful accountants. Be honest with ourselves. Look at what you're doing for the glory of Christ and see if it's just going through the motions of religion or is it truly because you are striving to do it for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Tonight, I want you to open your spiritual ledgers and I want you to look at the profit and loss columns. I want you to look at the assets and the liabilities because it really is a time an audit. We are going to look at some scripture just to remind us and try to back these things up of what we're, what Paul is, is telling us here. And we see over in John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, and I'll read, it says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. What are some things that we can do? And I, I just made a simple little outline here. I don't know if you can see that or not, but just a simple outline tonight of three simple par parts. One, two, and three. Now looking there at verses one, two, and three, we see here that in a faithful accountant, what must I do? Well, there's some words of caution. And Paul directs us and gives us those words of caution. Look there in verses one, in verse one. It says, finally. Now, what is that? That is a transitioning point, okay? He's transitioning from one point from the first two chapters here of Philippians to now chapters three and four because there's 44 verses that remain, all right? So that is our transition in this whole book. And he says there, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Now, look at that phrase, not tedious. It's basically of detaining a person unnecessarily, of uh, the idea of cutting into something, okay? You're cutting into it and you're looking at it. So, if he's going to tell us to look at our, 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 our ledgers here and see if what we're doing for the glory of Christ. And he says, it's not a waste of time. You know, it's not unnecessary. You ought to do this, but you need to understand that you ought to have some caution when you're doing it. For he says here, for you, it is safe. And he's saying you're doing this because it's like you're creating a safeguard. He's telling the Philippians here to, uh, it's like protect the Philippians from fallen under the spell of the false teachers. You, you recall at that time, 
the church here was battling the Judaizers. And man, they were teaching one thing that you had to go through all these religious acts to be saved. Uh, and if you didn't do those, then you weren't saved. It was like they were playing religion and they had all these ceremonies and all these things going on. And, and Paul comes along and says, hey guys, look at your life. Look at what you're doing and compare it and see what it is if it aligns to Jesus Christ or is it starting to align to what the Judaizers are teaching, the false teachers, and what they're trying to get you to do in all of these religious ceremonies. Don't allow that stuff to seep into the church there at Philippi. Now, he goes on there in verse 1, and he says to us, uh, he says, I, I want you to do this, but I want you to do it in the context of, of rejoicing, in a sense. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, that tells us and that signifies that as a believer, you ought to have joy. Joy should exist in your life. It's unrelated to all the, the circumstances of life. But when you have Jesus and you have that personal relationship with the Lord, there ought to be joy in your heart. There ought to be joy in your life. And he's just saying, hey, guys, you know, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. I know you're going through a difficult time. I know you're going through a challenging time. You've got all these false teachers and they're coming at you and they're, they're trying to bring you down, but there ought to be some rejoicing because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Um, we're not quite there yet, but over in Philippians chapter four, uh, verses six and seven says, a uh, great reminder for us, even in a time like this, is be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving in your heart, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Some good words for us. Let me tell you, you can rejoice today. You can rejoice tonight because of your relationship with Jesus Christ and your personal relationship with him. Um, now, he gets down into verse 2, and he says, okay, here's the words of caution. It's kind of like uh, a candor, of, uh, he's rebuking in a sense uh, of some things. He says, beware of dogs. Now, what is he referring to there? What is that uh, symbolizing to us? So, well, dogs, is he's comparing those to false teachers, uh, to those dirty scavengers that are just going around and, and trying to teach uh, that you have to go through all these religious ceremonies and you have to do this in order to be saved. And he says they're vicious. They're uncontrolled. Man, they just, it's like their bark is just unnerving and their bite is poisonous to you. So he says, beware of the dogs. But he goes on there and he says, beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers. Now, he's getting a little bit more personal here. He's getting a little bit more understanding with, with what's going on there at the church at Philippi because he says, beware of the evil workers. That's the Judaizers. That's the ones that, that prided themselves on being workers of righteousness. And yet Paul says, man, your works are evil. Okay? Because he, he's basically saying, hey, they're preaching a, a message of righteousness, okay? Now, again, it's good stuff, but it's not of repentance of sin and confessing your need for Jesus Christ and asking him to come into your heart. Um, and he goes on and he says there in verse 3, he says, Beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Now, what's he talking about there? Well, the Judaizers, one of their big things was, is they, they taught circumcision was necessary for salvation. And this is where Paul gets caught up, or this is where Paul begins to get uh, caught up in telling us about this circumcision. Now, what is circumcision? Circumcision basically means to, to cut around. It's a, it's a term that means to cut down, in a sense. So he's like he's saying here to us, if you remember 
in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings 18, uh, 28, you remember those prophets of Baal who would go around and, and because they believed this, that it was just part of their religion, part of their what they had to do to get saved was that they would begin to mutilate their bodies in all of these crazy rituals, religious rituals. And they thought they had to do that in order to be saved. Okay? So he's saying to us, hey, be careful. All right? There's this, you ought to be rejoicing in the Lord. You ought to, because of what Christ has done for you. And then he says, okay, but there's people coming around these false teachers, these Judaizers, and he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, because they're teaching you this false teaching that you have to do all of these things, these steps, these religious uh, rituals, whatever you want to call them, their ceremonies, whatever, in order to be saved. And he's saying here that the Judaizers who are big on this circumcision, so you had to be circumcised. It was a necessity, essential to salvation. Well, now he comes down into verse 3, and he says, For we are the circumcision, who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, I, I just kind of labeled this as just some claims of being redeemed, okay? Uh, again, I, I'm going to share several different scripture verses with you tonight, and one of those is uh, in Galatians 6.15, it says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor, nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Now, it kind of goes along with what he's saying here. Um, Paul also writes over in Romans chapter 2, verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now, what does all of that have to say to verse 3 here? Well, this outwardly riot, right is a value only when it reflects what's happening on the inside. This inner reality of a heart that is separated from sin unto God. You see, salvation results from the work of God's Spirit in the heart. Not something that I can do on the outside to earn my salvation, but it matters who controls my heart, who I've given my heart to, and when I allow Christ to come into me and live within me and transform me from the inside out. Uh, and what these Judaizers were doing because they were teaching, hey, you've got to do all this on the outside. you got to go through all of these rituals. you got to do all of these things to your body in order to be saved. And that's not the way it works at all. It's your heart from the inside out, not the outside in. Okay. Now, he also says here in verse 3, he says uh, some interesting things about um, who worship God. That little phrase there, who worships God. Worship means basically to to render respectful spiritual service in the inner person as opposed to just going through the motions, all right? Um, worship is so much more than just lip service. I mean, it's because of what's inside you, all right? And that's where it starts. That's where worship begins. And he says there, hey, you who worship God, all right? It means to start from the inside. All right? Not get involved in all of this stuff going on, this, these ceremonies or these rituals or these uh, uh, traditional things. You know, it starts from the inside. That's where worship begins. Uh, Matthew 15, 7 uh, says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Let me tell you, worship begins on the inside. And as you begin to take a, an audit of your heart and an audit of your life, 
Think about who has your heart. Is your heart controlled by Jesus Christ? Or are you just going through these emotions? Or are you just going through whatever it is in your worship? He goes on here and Paul says, as he's talking to the church at Philippi, he says, rejoice in, in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. Now, um, I, I guess basically what he's wanting us to understand and what he's saying to you and I tonight is a true Christian, a true Christ follower gives credit for all that he is to Christ. It's all because of Christ. It's not on your own strength. It's not on your own might, but it's because Jesus working through you that you can accomplish great and mighty things. It's because Christ is working in you that we can go to work and do the great commission and carry out the commands that Christ has given uh, to us. Now, he goes on and he says there uh, another interesting phrase. He uses who worship God, rejoice in Christ Jesus. But he also says no confidence in the flesh. Now, what's he saying here? Well, what is that uh, meaning? Well, he's referring to man's um, unredeemed humanness. You know, that side of us that that's not uncontrollable, you know? Uh, it's like... I can do it on my own strength. I have my own ability. I don't need anybody else showing me, telling me how to do this. Uh, I can do it a much better way than what God can do. You see what, you see what he's saying? Um, the Jews placed confidence in being circumcised, in being descendants of Abraham, um, performing all the, the external ceremonies, uh, the duties of the law, in a sense, doing all of those things. And that's how they gained their confidence, because they could accomplish those. They could do those. It was like they were doing things that could not save them. Remember, Paul also wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So understand that. It's like in the first three verses, he's just given us some words of caution here. As you look at your, your spiritual ledger, as you look at your profits and your losses, he's just saying, be careful, okay? I want you to do it, brethren, rejoicing. You rejoice because of what Christ has done for you. Um, but also be careful because there's these, these dogs, these false teachers that are chasing after you. And man, if they get you, they're, gonna, they're doing good things, but it's not God-like things. It's not what the scripture is teaching us. It's not what the instruction book is saying to us, okay? So, and now we look here in verses 4, 5, and 6. And it's like some words of confidence that Paul has given uh, to the church at Philippi. It says there in verse 4, he says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Why? Circumcised on the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, Paul comes along here, and he's just saying, okay, guys, okay, you false teachers. It's like Paul's just counteracting the Judaizers on the claims about their attainments, about what they have accomplished, Okay. He says, okay, you know, you teach these things, you're saying these things, but look at me. I was circumcised on the prescribed day, the eighth day. Paul's Jewish heritage was pure, okay? Benjamin, we know, was the second son of Rachel. It was that elite tribe of, of Israel that remained loyal to David's dynasty. Paul had Hebrew parents, um, Pharisee here, a, a legalistic 
type of uh, Judaism or kind of what you could say this this concerning the zeal uh, was what was that highest virtue of religion okay and he goes on he says okay concerning righteousness unrighteousness is by the law I follow the law so Paul is saying here he's given some words of confidence he's saying the standard of living the standard of righteous living is advocated by God's law by the instruction book Paul outwardly kept this all right now we see that and we just we can see how he backed up his claims okay as he gave those words of confidence um and now we get into verse seven tonight and it says but what things were gained to me these i have counted loss for christ um uh, I just labeled this as you, you, you always need to have wisdom as you look through your spiritual ledger, as you calculate your losses and your profits, okay? Um, and so Paul is saying this, he says, what, but what things were gain to me? What is that gain? We know that gain is, a, is an accounting term that means profit, okay? And we know uh, there's Paul uses that. He says, but what things were gained to me, comma, these I have counted loss for Christ. Gain, uh, accounting term, means profit. Loss means, again, a, uh, an accounting term used to describe a, a loss, a business loss. So, as we think about this, and we look at our ledger, record of uh, debts and credits, all right? Losses and gains liabilities and assets liability what what is that real quick something that that works to someone's disadvantage all right uh it's holding them back it's it's weighing them down in a sense asset anything owned that has some value um and he's saying here what things were gained to me that's where he's getting this asset okay things that were owned, that had value to him. But here's the problem. He says, but these I counted loss for Christ. You see, those little things there that were no benefit to salvation at all. Now, when Paul met Jesus Christ, he realized how futile his good works and how sinful were his claims of righteousness. And it's like this wonderful transaction took place. Paul lost some things, but he gained so much more than what he had lost. He'd lost whatever was gained to him personally apart from Christ. But he comes along here and he says, but I began to measure these treasures against what Jesus had to offer. And Paul realized that all of these things that he held dear was really nothing compared to what he had in Jesus Christ. A Christ follower, Christian, I want you to understand Sometimes we need to go back and we need to look at our spiritual ledger. I mean, and I know things get hard, it gets difficult. You know, this pandemic things, you just, man, it's just, when's it going to be over? And sometimes if you're not careful, you think, man, I, I, it's like I'm giving up. I'm not praying as much as I need to, or I'm not studying the word of God as much as I need to. And I just want you to understand that you are nothing without Christ. Because of Christ, you can do great and mighty things. And Paul is just coming along here and says, Hey, why don't you be a faithful accountant? Look what Christ has done for you and continues to do for you. The prophets 
compared to what you think you could do in your own way, in your own strength, in your own mind. Um, and he gives us some great words of caution. He gives us some words of confidence. And he also says, hey, when you begin to look at everything, have wisdom. Let God give you wisdom in calculating. Because verse 7, when he says, I looked at everything. And what things I thought were gained to me, when I looked at it in comparison or in part of my relationship to Jesus Christ, I counted as loss. Maybe tonight we need to take a deep look at our lives and look what we are and look what we have in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And tonight, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, oh, I encourage you, I encourage you to seek someone, talk to someone that can share with you the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the most important decision that you'll ever make in your life to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Well, there we are. First seven verses of Philippians chapter three. Next week, we'll pick up in verse eight. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. And I look forward to worshiping with you on uh, this Sunday, uh, the 17th. And we're gonna have a great time as we recognize our high school seniors uh, this Sunday morning. So it'll be a wonderful time together. Uh, hope you'll tune in and watch us. Have a great night. See you soon.